This is my mother, Joni, world's best communicator and letter writer. That is, until dementia changed everything. Before dementia, Joni's handwritten letters were an anchor of love and encouragement for me. Her letters provided humor in some otherwise tense situations, like the time I was a college freshman attending a rather somber and serious sorority initiation ceremony. We were asked to reach under our chairs and retrieve a letter written by our parents in honor of this big milestone. My sorority sisters wept as they read their deeply moving letters. I opened my envelope and burst out in laughter as these words were revealed. Dear Stephanie, we hope this ceremony means more to you than it does to us. <laughs> Love, Mom and Dad. As Joni's dementia brought her letter writing to a halt, she resorted to sending greeting cards for a while. She collected over 150 greeting cards during the last years of her life. My father was thrilled that his wife had a greeting card habit because most of his friends' wives had much more expensive habits. <laughs> Since her passing, I continue to send out these cards on her behalf to family and friends. I love feeling her essence as I prepare a card for its recipient. As Joni forgot about her greeting cards, she also forgot about the nature of our relationship. I remember the day I was driving her to an appointment when she turned to me and asked, why do people keep referring to you as my daughter? I felt a lump in my throat and had to swallow hard. And taking a deep breath and pushing back my tears, I asked her, what does our relationship feel like to you? She responded, well, you're my best friend. That's how I think of you. You're my best and dearest friend. I reached for her hand and said, yes, best friends. It's so nice to have such a close relationship, isn't it? Joni smiled at me, and I felt like we narrowly missed falling into that deep, dark pit of disconnection that dementia can create. I also knew that having the title of best friend was the absolute highest honor I could have. It was kind of like a promotion. <laughs> that moment sent a powerful signal to me that Joni and I would need to find a simpler, clearer way of communicating with one another, one that didn't require us to get it right, but instead fostered us staying connected. Around this time, I made a new friend named Jennifer, who is a highly gifted channel. That means she communicates with souls. I know, I didn't believe it myself until I experienced it. How did I know this was real? Because I could feel it on my skin as it erupted in goosebumps every time a message resonated very deeply within me. And I could feel it on the back of my neck as those little hairs stood on end. And I could feel it in my heart as a warmth and peace that I could not explain. I asked Jennifer to channel Joni's soul to give me guidance. Through Jennifer, Joni's essence reminded me not to take myself so seriously, not to take dementia so seriously, and to keep my sense of humor also, to cherish our moments together. Joni's soul also encouraged me to become my own clear channel. So Jennifer referred me to her mentor, and I took channeling classes. That's actually a thing. <laughs> I also attended multiple workshops taught by a world-renowned psychic medium. And I read every book on the subject of channeling and spiritual communication that I could get my hands on. I combined all this new information with my clinical understanding of the brain. You see, I'm a speech therapist with over 20 years of clinical experience, helping my patients find and create new brain pathways to access their memories, their language, and their environment. Once I had a patient with a stroke who was unable to say any any coherent words except for the phrase hair appointments. Together, we found many ways to convey meaning using the only phrase she could utter. Another time, I had a patient who sustained a severe brain injury after a freak accident with his concrete mixer truck. The injury knocked out his memory from the previous year of his life to the point where he did not remember having proposed to his fiancée or even having met her. The three of us worked to piece together those aspects of his life that the injury had knocked loose. 
Unfortunately, unlike a brain injury or stroke, dementia is progressive and does not improve. As I was looking for new ways to communicate with Joni, I read Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight, and watched her phenomenal TED Talk. Dr. Taylor is a neuroanatomist who describes her personal experience having a stroke at the age of, excuse me, 37. She brilliantly explains how the left side of our brain is focused on the past and the future. It solves problems and it thinks linearly. It manages that constant internal chatter that joins our internal and external worlds. Whereas the right side of our brain is in the present moment. It thinks in pictures. It's creative, receptive, and intuitive, and it picks up on the subtle energy of consciousness. So basically, all I had to do was figure out how to quiet the left side of my brain with its constant chatter, in order to engage the right side of my brain to guide me in making the link to Joni's consciousness. Well, that should be a no-brainer, right? With a lot of practice, I was able to make this link and use it to support a more meaningful connection with Joni, even in the face of dementia. Interestingly enough, it was the breakdown and dissolution of standard communication that opened the door to discovering our essential communication. Towards the end of Joni's dementia, she began a phase of constant pacing. In my attempt to join her, I would link arms and pace with her around the house, back and forth. We would go from the bedroom to the kitchen and back again. I would quiet my thoughts with their constant chatter. And listen deeply for her soul's communication. What I received through the intuitive right side of my brain was that Joni was desperate for peace, and she needed end-of-life support. This message was a surprise to me, and I questioned it. I'd assumed Joni would carry on as she had been for many more months, perhaps even years. Her body was so healthy and strong that an outside observer would never know she had advanced dementia unless they spoke with her. I kept her soul's communication to myself for a while. Then I started to see advertisements for hospice services in the magazines I was reading, and I started to see hospice delivery trucks on the roads. Out of the blue, a friend told me about the hospice services her father was receiving. It was impossible for me to ignore the synchronicity of Joni's soul's communication combined with the signs I was noticing all around. The time came to discuss the issue with Joni's doctor. Who was equally shocked that we were considering end-of-life care? After all, Joni had recently wrestled a nurse who was attempting to take a blood sample from her, and she'd won. She certainly was not your typical hospice patient. Her doctor agreed to a trial of hospice services, and two months later, Joni passed peacefully in the comfort of her home with family by her side. I am so glad I listened to her soul's silent communication. The journey through my mother's dementia revealed unexpected opportunities. I learned to connect with Joni and subsequently hundreds of others on a heart and soul level. I learned that when old ways of communicating become impossible, there are untapped connections that can be made. Becoming a professional intuitive channel. Has allowed me to tune in to the subtle energy of consciousness of countless loving beings, both on the earth and beyond. I receive messages and information for which I have had no prior access or knowledge. One client's mother's soul showed me an image of an elderly woman riding a mechanical bull. I thought this rather strange until my client affirmed that her mother did indeed ride a mechanical bull when she was in her 80s, and there's a photograph to prove it. In another session, a child's soul communicated to her mother that she was sad and angry that her outdoor treasures were not permitted inside the home. Her mother affirmed that the child's collections of pine cones and snails were indeed prohibited from taking up residence in their house. The family found a special place in the child's room for her treasures. And her tantrums have since subsided. My years spent studying and practicing techniques to more fully engage the intuitive right side of my brain have really paid off. My life as a professional intuitive channel is definitely more difficult to explain than my prior work as a speech therapist. However, 
I have found ways to get very comfortable with that softer, more subtle energy of consciousness, and I place my trust in that. It's what has allowed me to maintain a meaningful and loving connection with Joni, and is the basis for what I teach my clients. I invite each of you to imagine what it might feel like to use the intuitive right side of your brain to silently communicate with someone else. With whom would you choose to communicate? And what might their consciousness reveal to you? What might your consciousness reveal to them? Consider that no matter what the past has entailed, you can change the way you relate to another at any time. Perhaps it begins with a handwritten letter sharing your heart. Perhaps it involves forgiveness. Perhaps it enlists self-trust in your own inner voice. Whatever it is, the journey is yours. May it be blessed. Thank you.